All right, perhaps it's a good time to get started and people can continue to join the meeting. Um, so first I want to say hi to everyone. Welcome to our webinar. Thank you so much for joining us and I hope you're all keeping well and safe as we get into the fall months. Uh, my name is Ashna Jassy and I will be chairing today's webinar with Dr. Hina Mystery. To give you a little bit more information about me, I'm a PhD candidate in social psychology at the University of Guelph. I'm also a graduate member of the CIRCLE Committee, and today's webinar is brought to us by CIRCLE, which is the Canada-India Research Centre for Learning and Engagement. CIRCLE was established in February 2020 at the University of Guelph, and it aims to be an interdisciplinary nucleus in Canada for cutting-edge research on the India and the Indian diaspora to showcase, advocate, catalyze, and foster an equitable, respectful, and sustained engagement exchange of knowledge between Canadian and Indian scholars on complex and emerging and unexplored topics related to sustainability and social and economic well-being. All that being said, we would like to welcome you to today's webinar. We are very fortunate to have Dr. Hina Mystery joining us today and sharing her research with us. Um, I'd also like to introduce Dr. Hina and all the wonderful work that she's doing. So Dr. Hina is the Equity, Diversity and Inclusion Training Specialist in the Office of the Provost and Vice President Academic at Wilfrid Laurier University in Canada. She was an undergraduate student at the University of Guelph as well uh, in the Department of History from 2009 to 2013. She holds a PhD in History from Queen's University and her dissertation examined debates between anti-colonial nationalists and the self-identified Indian liberals they critiqued. Uh, these Indian liberals who they critiqued argued for the reform of empire into a liberal imperial federation. These figures employed the argument for imperial reform to institutionalize Indian parity with white settler citizenship, especially for global Indian diaspora in the earliest 20th century. Dr. Hina has held visiting fellowships at the Weatherhead Initiative on Global History at Harvard University and the Center for Indian Studies in Africa at the University of Witwatersrand in Johannesburg. Currently, she's also collabor collaborating with our local artist in Guelph, Jackie Reina, to research Guelph South Asian diaspora histories. So thank you very much for joining us today, Hina, and we're very much looking forward to hearing more about your work. Um, before we dive in, um, there's just a few logistical points that I'll point out for today's webinar. Um, I'll ask that everyone please keep their microphones muted during the webinar. Um, and also if you could turn your videos off and that way we just are ensuring we can establish a strong connection to view Hina's presentation. In terms of the format of the webinar, Hina will be providing us with some slides about her work and then we will have a question period after her presentation. To ask a question, feel free to use the WAVE uh, reaction, which is at the bottom of your Zoom screen. So uh, we will have a question period at that time. Feel free to use that emoji and then we will, uh, sorry, I will uh, call on you to ask your question. Another option is you can feel free to type in your question in the chat bar at any time, and uh, I will ask these on your behalf during the question period. And lastly, just ask that we keep in mind the timing uh, for the webinar, because we'd like to include as many questions and comments as possible, uh, and we have until 12.15 Eastern time, so please keep that in mind as well. All right, at this point, I will pass it over to Hina. Thank you. Thanks so much, Ashna. Um, I'm going to share my screen now. Try and get this working. Okay, can you guys see okay? Yeah, we can see you. Thank you. And you can see just the screen, right? That's just right. Just the, the slideshow. Okay, awesome. Thank you so much. Um, so, so good, good, good morning, everybody. Thanks so much for joining um, and, and making the time to, to come to my talk. And thanks as well for Shraddha and, um, you know, for, for inviting me and having me here and to, to Ashna for, you know, doing all the coordination and setting up and everything. I really appreciate your hard work and, and all of this. Um, so um, I'm going to move on. So I'm going to be talking today about the repatriation debate after the abolition of indenture. Um, so I'll be talking about basically debates surrounding the repatriation of Indians settled in British colonies after the abolition of the indenture system in 1917. 
So ex-indentured Indians, their descendants, um, sorry, ex-indentured Indians and their descendants, um, Indians who sat at the Raja's decision-making tables, non-indentured Indian diaspora communities, white settler governments and planter governments all shared ideas about where exactly in the British Empire India das Indian diaspora should be. Um, I'm certainly not the first person to be talking about repatriation in the aftermath of indenture. Um, many um, Caribbean and South African scholars of Indian diaspora and indenture, like Uma Dupelia Mistri, Basio Mangru, Lomar Shrupnarayan, and others have written about patterns of repatriation and reindenture and the marginalization of Indian repatriates and those who decided to not to return to post, um, sorry, and, and those who basically of those who decided to return to post to India post indenture. Um, I'd like to add to this conversation though by thinking about the larger influence. Uh, the larger significance of diaspora to the parameters of Indian nationalism. And particularly, I'm interested in how policy and nationalist rhetoric differentiated repatriates, depending on where they were coming from in the context in which they sort of left to, to, to labor overseas, um, do other things. So discussions surrounding repatriation during the interwar years, though, um, I would argue that they reveal how Indian nationalists and others resisting British imperialism sometimes drew borders around belonging as Indian, um, especially in British India. So I put up a picture of um, plantation locations pre 1840 because uh, we're gonna we're gonna get some context here. Um, and I want to start by talking about slavery. So um, I want to start by giving some context around just also the some context surrounding indenture um, and other forms of Indian labor migration and repatriation. So this story um, has roots in what happened after the abolition of slavery in the British Empire in 1833. Um, so after that happens, um, reparations were paid to slave owners in the British Empire. Um, in 1835, slave owners received financial compensation amounting to 40% of the calculated market value of their slaves. This amounted to a total of 20 million pounds, an expense that would amount to about 300 billion today is the figure that um, historian Chris Majapra gives. And British taxpayers finished paying off these reparations to slave owners made back in, um, in the 1830s, uh, only in 2015. So now I pulled up a, a location of, um, sorry, the locations of plantations post 1870. Um, so in tracing where slave owners spent their reparation money post um, abolition of slavery, historian Chris Manjapra has found that much of this wealth was reinvested into bringing plantation agriculture to British colonies in the Indian Ocean and Southeast Asia. The reinvestment of these reparations brought tea, rubber, sugar, indigo, coffee, and other plantations to Ceylon which is contemporary Sri Lanka, Malaya, the Strait Settlement, Burma, South Africa, et cetera, the list goes on. And so um, I think like that context is important to know if we're gonna, once, once I start talking about what I'm gonna talk about in a minute. Um, and then the next thing I wanna talk about is um, indenture. So um, once again, as, as I reiterate, um, as I want to reiterate, the abolition of slavery did not end on free forms of labor. They just morphed into different forms of unfree and semi-free labor, including apprenticeships that bound former slaves to their ex-masters for a fixed portion of each working day for four to six years. Um, and rather than paying fair wages or reparations to emancipated slaves themselves, planters across the British Empire lobbied colonial and metropolitan governments to organize another steady stream of workers to keep the cost of labor low. Um, these planters had relied, had long relied on government for support in sustaining the production of goods, especially sugar and cotton, whose profitability had depended on slave labor. Indentured Asian migration was the system that arose to meet planter demands as a result of all this lobbying. Um, indenture was a contract system that brought workers from British India to plantations in the Caribbean, the African continent, and Fiji. Um, and what you'll see on the slide is just a map of, um, this is taken from The Economist, um, a map of the different well, sorry, like a chart of the different areas in which indentured um, laborers from India went between 1830 um, to the 1830s to 1917. Um, but out, indenture wasn't the only form of labor migration um, leaving the subcontinent in the 19th century and the early 20th century. Um, outside of indenture, other forms of labor migration and recruitment systems, such as the Kangani and Maestri systems, brought workers from British India across the Bay of Bengal to Ceylon, Malaya, the Strait Settlement colonies in Burma. Um, in his book, Crossing the Bay of Bengal, Harvard historian Sunil Amruth points out that from 1843 to, um, to 1940s, 90% of all emigration from India moved across the Bay of Bengal and, and not necessarily to um, indentured areas where indentured labor was employed. 
by 1917, under the pressures of World War I, um, laborers went to war fronts instead of colonial sugar estates. Um, and combined with, with, those, with, that, with those restrictions, um, as well as agitation across the Indian subcontinent and in the diaspora against indenture, the system eventually came to an end in 1917. So now I'll move on to talking a little bit about how people were talking about repatriation after the abolition of indenture. Um, so the abolition of indenture was not the end of the story of colonial administrators and planters attempting to manage the movement of, colon of colonized people, particularly Black and Asian workers across the globe. People of all walks of life in India and the Indian diaspora protested the indenture system. From the Bhojpuri uh, resistance songs of agricultural workers in the countryside, warning people not to sign themselves away to recruiters to elite Indian nationalists who sat at the decision-making tables of the Raj, to Indian communities settled in British colonies across the globe who weren't necessarily migrant workers, it was clear that protests against indenture crossed several boundaries, like both um, class-based, caste-based, um, geographical, et cetera. And in the years immediately following, preceding and following the abolition of indenture, um, we saw the rise of the anti-colonial, the rise of anti-colonial nationalism as a mass movement um, in India and, and across like Indian diaspora all over the world. Um, however, the abolition of indenture, um, repatriation, and the varied context in which it applied marked boundaries and the parameters of Indian nationalism. Um, particularly, discourse surrounding repatriation highlighted which emigrants from South Asia belonged in India and which were considered far better off overseas. Indian nationalists who spoke against indenture during the 20th, during the, around the turn of the 20th century became obsessed with repatriating those who finished their indenture contracts in the Caribbean, Fiji, and the African continent. <coughs> Excuse me. M.K. Gandhi, um, Gopal Krishna Gokhale, who was an Indian um, liberal reformer, and several Indian members of the Indian Legislative Assembly and the leadership of some Indian diaspora political organizations in, uh, in different places, were among those who argued for repatriation as the most desirable alternative to remaining in places with anti-Indian legislation. And their reasoning was riddled with fears that the overwhelming dispersion of unskilled Indian laborers, instead of merchants, scholars, lawyers, and others they considered more respectable, um, as obstructed the extension of the civil and political rights of white British subjects to Indian British subjects. And so in response to earlier calls for repatriation, uh, others raised alarm about um, any form of organized repatriation effort targeted at Indians overseas, especially those not born in India. And stories started to circulate about repatriates living in the slums of major coastal cities in India who face ostracization and poverty upon their arrival. Many who journeyed to India with their families under government-sponsored incentivized repatriation programs had not lived in India for years, had children born abroad, or were themselves born abroad. And so it didn't, like, they didn't necessarily assume that um, coming back to India was coming back to a homeland of sorts. Um, so um, today I'm gonna be talking about two, I'm gonna focus my talk on two particularly interesting responses to the end of indenture in the 1920s. The first is a piece of legislation that criminalized the emigration of unskilled laborers beyond the Bay of Bengal. And then the second is a report that called for the end of repatriation campaigns. It was co-authored by um, the South African born son of indentured sugar estate workers and the journalist who helped um, Fiji repatriate Totoram Sanadia write his account of indenture in Fiji. Um, so now I wanna talk about um, some efforts made to contain um, laborers post indenture. So Indians in the decision-making chambers of the Raj saw the dispersion of Indian manual laborers overseas as undermining their post-war efforts to, to obtain civil and political parity with white British subjects in the Commonwealth. Indian elites feared that the inability of Indian laborers to return risked rendering India and globally dispersed Indians as coolies, which is a derogatory, derogatory term for an Indian worker um, in, in several contexts, although it, it also was sort of like reclaimed later on um, among like diaspora, um, indentured diaspora communities. So discussions between members of the Legislative Assembly surrounding the management of Indian mi labor migration, um, which took place around the passing of the Indian Emigration Act of 1922, um, capture an ambivalence around the presence of coolies in areas not proximate uh, to the Indian subcontinent. Um, so these discussions clearly indicate that the bill's restrictions aim to contain Indian laborers within India in order to reshape India's global image away from that of a labor reserve. 
Um, many Indian proponents of the bill referred to immigrants as quote, uh, immigrants as quote, ignorant workmen who heedlessly compromised India's self-respect when they went abroad. Some Indian members of the Legislative Assembly and Council of State, though, um, pushed back against these ideas. And this included um, figures like Narayan Mala Joshi, founder of the All India Trade Union Congress, who raised concern that the bill unnecessarily criminalized those who were who tried to migrate outside of its um, provisions, which restricted immigration of, of labor, um, um, of laborers. But the bill was meant to lay like dead and was meant to lay dead the indentured system in its grave by curtailing unskilled um, labor migration to anywhere but the Bay of Bengal. Um, and the bill illustrates how fears surrounding the dispersion of unskilled um, laborers attempt, exempted um, the areas where most Indian immigrants went to work. But as I mentioned earlier, between 1843 to 1940, 90% of all emigration from India was destined for Burma, Ceylon, Malaya, areas around the Bay of Bengal. And many of these migrants worked on tea, rubber, and sugar estates that were funded by reparations payments for slave for slave owners, two slave owners who profited off of transatlantic slavery, as I also mentioned earlier. Um, the exclusion of the British colonies in the Bay of Bengal from the Indian Immigration Act's restrictions meant that it would not do what it claimed, which is to clean up after indenture by containing unskilled labor immigration. So now I want to move on to the second example of um, discussions about repatriation that I want to talk about today. So within white settler colonies, especially South Africa, repatriation was synonymous with containing Indian numbers um, and preserving areas for white settlement. So from 1895, the South African government organized um, and incentivized the repatriation of Indians and the dispossession of black South Africans in order to preserve the colony for white settlement. And one of these measures was the requirement of a three pound tax. It's, it's quite famous actually, if anyone's read anything at all about Gandhi. Um, so one of these requirements, one of these measures was the requirement of a three pound tax from Indians who resided in the colony outside of an indenture contract. Many Indians who could not afford to live in South Africa outside of an indenture contract or um, couldn't afford to pay the three pound tax yet had no real connection to India ended up like repatriating there or reindenturing reindenturing themselves in order to be able to stay. Um, in 1914, though, the Indian Relief Act, which is the product of Gandhi's um, South African civil disobedience campaigns from 1913 to 14, eliminated the three pound tax. So the Indian Relief Act provided Indians, including those born in South Africa, with a free passage to British India, provided that they give up their rights to re-enter South Africa. And Gandhi intended for this new program of incentivized repatriation to assuage or like eliminate white settler fears of Indian encroachment. And he deduced that if white South Africans could see that Indian numbers would either stabilize or reduce, that they would either be less compelled to pass racist legis that they would be less compelled to pass racist legislation targeting Indians. Um, but by 1927, um, both white settlers and Indians in South Africa were really dissatisfied with the Indian Relief Act's terms, um, especially its repatriation terms. So white settlers were upset with it because in South, uh, they were adamant that repatriation under the Indian Relief Act did not actually adequately reduce Indian numbers. And then many South African Indians were unhappy with how enthusiastically the South African government began mobilizing the repatriation component of the Indian Relief Act to eliminate Indian numbers in the colony. And this led the governments of India and South Africa to renegotiate the terms of the Indian Relief Act and create yet another incentivized repatriation scheme with slightly better terms. And this new repatriation scheme, which is called the Assisted Emigration Scheme, provided a bonus of 20 pounds to voluntary emigrants, free transportation back to India, and um, assistance for re repatriates upon return. Unlike the former repatriation schemes, the assisted emigration scheme did not require Indians to immediately give up their right to domicile in South Africa. Um, and between 1927 to 1940, over 16,000 Indians left under the terms of the assisted emigration scheme. Um, however, South African Indians continued to protest this new repatriation scheme because it did not actually challenge white supremacy. Although it gave pro some provisions to Indians to remain in South Africa, it did not ch challenge the premise of white settler entitlement to that land. Um, so now I want to talk about some that's folks okay, who just got one comment. Um, sorry to interrupt you. Just uh, we have one comment asking uh, if you could speak just a tiny bit slower. Oh sure. Uh, yeah. Thank you so much. Of course. Sorry about that. Oh no problem. Okay. So now I want to talk a little bit about um, some folks who were raising alarm about the repatriation scheme. Um, so some of the most prominent voices in support of India's decolonization endorsed repatriation. 
However, many activists who supported marginalized repatriates raised alarm about it as well. So until the 1930s, the most recognized commentators on Indians overseas, including M.K. Gandhi and Reverend Charles Freer Andrews, argued that for ex-indentured Indians and their descendants, repatriation to India was the most desirable alternative to remaining in the colonies with anti-Indian legislation. Um, in the 1920s, Charles Freer Andrews, whose picture you will see um, in like the middle towards the left, so he was an Anglican missionary um, and a friend of Gandhi who independently investigated and reported on the position of Indians in Fiji, Malaya, Kenya, and South Africa. Um, in 1931, Bawani Dayal Sanyasi, the South African born son of indentured sugar estate workers, co authored a report with journalist Banarsi Das Chaturvedi on the hardships facing repatriates. And you'll see both those pictures on the right. Um, their report contained quotations from interviews with repatriates themselves, as well as photographs from uh, of the Natal House in Madras, which the government of India had opened to provide um, shelter for repatriates under the Assisted Emigration Act. And the photo in the poster advertising the talk is actually of the Natal House in Madras, which housed repatriates who struggled upon their return to India. So um, Sanyasi himself in the top right hand corner, um, he had experienced the hardships of repatriation as a child when his father returned to India following his mother's death. Um, in 1904, as a 12 year old boy, he returned to India with his father who had actually, he actually had the financial means to build up a comfortable life upon return um, by coming as Amandar in their um, ancestral village in Bihar. Um, so this is very much unlike many of the repatriates um, who didn't actually have many financial means to support themselves upon arrival. So when he and his father first returned to their village, the panchayat or the village assembly was willing to accept Sanyasi's father as, uh, was unwilling to accept Sanyasi as his father's legitimate son, since it could not be guaranteed that his mother, who died in Johannesburg in 1899, was of the same caste. Um, and so the panchayat told his father that he must choose between staying with his children or integrating into the community. And his father ended up deciding to label his um, sannyasi, his South African born son, as illegitimate in exchange for acceptance into the community post repatriation. So um, sannyasi, this obviously this experience stuck with him for his life and he became a transnational activist both in India and South Africa who would like cross between the two, um, who protested repatriation schemes throughout his life, um, because partially because of his own experience with repatriation. Um, and then, as I mentioned before, Banarsi Das Chaturvedi, who was in the bottom of the right-hand side, um, had assisted Totoram Sanadya, who was another indentured repatriate, um, write his widely distributed My 21 Years in Fiji um, pamphlet, which condemned indenture. So both Sanyasi and Chaturvedi wrote, wrote a report against both Andrews and Gandhi's assertions that repatriation schemes could actually like do anything to eliminate white settler fears of like the Indian problem, which is a term used to describe white fears of Indian competition in South Africa. Okay, so now I wanna talk a little bit more about their report. Um, so in the report's introduction, Chaturvedi admitted that while his earlier work had actively campaigned um, for the repatriation of indentured workers, he had mistakenly thought that people of Indian descent born overseas could happily settle in India. Um, and now he was sure that they could only ever live fulfilling lives outside of India, where many had anyway spent most of their lives. And the report detailed how Indian repatriation after the abolition of indenture had disastrously left in, um, repatriates stranded and misplaced in India, which was essentially a foreign country to a lot of them. Um, after working with Chaturvedi to support repatriates in Calcutta, um, Charles Freer Andrews would eventually condemn repatriation as well. Um, and correspondence between Andrews and Chaturvedi reveals the, the desperation among repatriates settled in, um, in Calcutta. Andrews would meet with repatriates, some of whom insisted that they be sent back to the colonies that they had formerly resided in or else they would commit suicide. Um, and in his autobiography, Sanyasi criticized um, Andrews, Gandhi, and others who spoke about repatriation for endorsing it, while the voices of repatriates themselves were silenced for fear of how they might escalate Indian public opinion against the Raj who had in also endorsed these repatriation schemes. Sanyasi was disturbed by the despicable conditions of repatriates who suffered malarial mosquitoes, homelessness, disease, and poverty after their arrival um, in Calcutta. And despite his grassroots work with repatriates, he continued to read appraisals of the repatriation scheme by Gandhi and Andrews in major newspapers well into the 1920s. Um, and so he was very agitated and he attempted to publish his own denouncement of the repatriation schemes, but was refused publication several times before he ended up being successful. 
Um, historian Uma Dupelia Mistri's work um, delves deeply into the annual reports on the repatriation schemes um, that were written by the agent representing the government of India in South Africa. Um, and also she delves into like records from the government of India on the repatriates under the assisted immigration scheme. And she notes that there were discrepancies in wages and the cost of living in India as compared to South Africa. And that in combination with um, isolation that they encountered in India translated to the economic marginalization of many repatriates. Many were caught between a rock and a hard place facing unemployment when post-World War I economic, um, the global economic crisis hit South Africa in the late 1920s, leading to pressure on industry and agriculture to tackle um, white unemployment by hiring primarily white workers. Um, so now I wanna talk about um, Indian colonization schemes, which also kind of came out of the repatriation conversation. So in light of the growing public discussion over, marginalized, over the marginalized place of repatriates taking shape after the abolition of indenture, um, Gandhi had actually written in favor of organized migration schemes that um, placed Indian repatriates in other colonies that wanted access to a constant stream of Indian laborers. So sugar producing colonies like British Guyana and Fiji had received a steady stream uh, of, of Indian laborers since the 1830s. But as I mentioned before, World War I suspended the flow of labor to sugar colonies in order to supply um, labor to the war fronts. And so um, in, in combination with that, a rise in food prices, influenza outbreaks, pandemic like we're seeing now, um, and more competitive wages in other industries, um, coupled with the abolition of Indian indenture, and that drew workers away from sugar estates. So no longer having the um, supplies of labor that allowed them to keep wages low and turn um, a profit for themselves, sugar estate workers, um, owner, sorry, sugar estate owners in British Guyana and Fiji turned to lobbying their governments to recruit like free quote unquote free um, migrant colonists from British India to settle as like free agriculturalists um, in, in sugar colonies. So in Fiji, um, planters had begun by the 1880s to lease out like small plots of larger sugar estates to Indians over, to overseas Indians, uh, sorry, to Indian overseers and laborers who had completed their indenture contracts. Um, but as the cost of living increased after World War I also, laborers demanded um, wage increases, but planters were of course resistant to that. Um, because it cut into their profits. Um, so white settler governments, including the South African government, colluded with um, the governments of sugar, sugar colonies who were looking for another stream of labor, um, especially in the Caribbean and in Fiji, um, who, just, who wanted like unfettered access to laborers after the abolition of indenture. And so these Indian colonization schemes were meant to like move Indian workers who like they were trying to, to white settler governments were trying to um, uh, like repatriate away or incentivize to leave to sugar colonies that wanted them as workers anyway. Um, and there was an example of that happening where like in um, Sima Sohi, um, and I think Lisa Chilton also wrote about this in Canada where um, in order to like incentivize the departure of um, Punjabis from BC, um, they tried to attract people to go as like colonists um, to Honduras. Um, so again, this is also tied up with our own like local history here in Canada. So with that, I just want to give a few concluding thoughts and wrap it up. So the provision of repatriation helped um, distinguish indenture from slavery, even though planters often avoided honoring that component of the indenture contract or offered alternatives to repatriation. Um, throughout the existence of inden Indian indenture, the government of India had pushed for the guarantee of return, free return passages for immigrants. Um, although Indian activists writing against repatriation sometimes distinguished it from deportation, they criticized both as forms of expulsion. Both were legalized forms of expulsion for sure. Um, officially deportation at this, when I read it in these contexts, denoted exile without due process that could be carried out regardless of whether or someone owned property or had children born in the state that deported them. Whereas like when they talk about repatriation, it's kind of sometimes just differentiated as um, while being state orchestrated, it might appear to be consensual on the surface. However, those who protested against repatriation schemes in their writing and activism highlighted like the overlaps between deportation and repatriation. Um, and they oftentimes describe repatriation schemes as deportation as well. So um, post indenture, the many stakeholders in the global dispersion of Indians um, debated who should be allowed to, to leave British India's shores and where Indian labor should be allowed to work post indenture. Um, colonies which no longer had access to an unlimited stream of indentured workers contorted themselves to find new ways to attract free Indian laborers. Um, and white settler colonies around the Indian Ocean, littoral, searched for new ways to manage and reduce Indian numbers. 
And so I guess the final thought that I want to give about this is that the story of repatriation after the abolition of indenture helps historians problematize the assumption that British India was an inherent home for Indians overseas, um, which is like a common theme in Indian nationalist rhetoric um, of the 1920s and 30s. Um, so with that, I just want to thank everybody for, for coming and listening. <laughs> and I'm looking forward to your questions. Great. Thank you so much, Hina, for your fascinating talk. Um, I think there's a lot that we can dive into in terms of questions on this topic. Um, we will now move on to our question period. So again, if you have any questions to ask, feel free to use the wave emoji, which is located at the bottom of your Zoom screen. Um, and I will call on you to uh, ask your question. Um, at that point, you can unmute yourself and feel free to engage in the conversation. Um, the other option is to uh, write your questions into the chat bar and uh, those ones I will ask on your behalf to Hina. So uh, there's a few options there. Um, so I'll see maybe if anyone is waving their hands. Okay, so we uh, have a question from Harshida uh, Yalamarti. So please feel free, um, I guess I can unmute you. Well, perhaps you can unmute yourself, Harshida, and- Yes. Uh, thank you. Hi, thank you. I just, uh, Hina, that was a really wonderful presentation. Thank you so much. That was a lot of information uh, <laughs> compressed into a very small package, but, and I have, I, there's just so much more to explore, I think, there. Uh, but yeah, thank you so much for your presentation. Um, my question really was about, uh, was just a request for you to maybe elaborate a little bit more on the caste and gender aspect that you spoke about briefly, uh, especially where uh, the panchayat uh, of the village basically refuses to accept uh, the family, uh, the family back, right? And um, and there's that very sort of gendered aspect of lineage or inheritance and uh, like the taboos around um, traveling abroad. So if you could elaborate a little bit on that, I, it's very interesting. And I was wondering if there was any connection with some of the folk songs that you spoke about. Um, I mean, I would love to hear more about that too. The folk songs that were warning people to not sign the contracts and not go abroad. And wondering if the sort of migration and caste taboos were part of that warning that uh, activists or communities were giving each other in terms of, you know, saying don't go. So, yeah, I, I mean, I have, again, lots of questions, but these are the ones that are off the top of my head. So I might take up more space later, but thank you so much for your presentation. Yeah, thank you. And also, it's nice to finally meet you. <laughs> digitally. Um, so thank you so much. These are really important questions and I'm really glad that you asked them. Um, so um, I'm going to try and answer, I think, both at once. So I would say that, um, yeah, that this is kind of the interesting thing about um, like the repatriation question. Um, and also I think one, one thing that I wish maybe more scholars would bring more into it is also the ways in which like caste and race Kind of overlap in this too and like these anxieties about like caste purity um do often like overlap with with a race as well um so yeah and sorry just to interrupt you but i was just thinking about how that sent and i was wondering if you think that this kind of purity and sort of lineage and blood purity is if we can talk about that as a colonial mechanism because it's the same thing you see in for instance the indian act here right yeah uh, and like the burden of proving membership to a community or not with your actions falls on the women. Yes. But at the same time, I know, for instance, you and I have talked about how caste is not only a colonial construct, right? That's yeah. a, a misreading of that. And caste exists before and outside of colonial structures. Of course, it's influenced and constructed by it. But yeah. Anyway, so, sorry. No, no, that's... I again, like these are really important points. And so like one of the things that about the, the song, so one of the things that I find really interesting is that um, 
also you should definitely read um ashutosh kumar who's like written a lot on the the bojpuri like songs and resistance songs about indenture um but one of the things that's kind of interesting at least that, that i kind of notice is that um a lot of the songs like focus on i've noticed like safety or you know don't give yourselves up um to the like the thing that you'll be sent away to somewhere that you don't know there's that there's like um conditions are being hidden whereas the Indian like nationalist rhetoric is like obsessed with these questions of um, like sexual immorality among like indentured women um, and that you shouldn't be going overseas because of the risk of like illegitimate children or marrying out of caste. Um, and the other like when you read like I, when you read Sanyasi's like autobiography um, and you read like even Totoram Sanadio's like biography about um, repeat like uh, about indenture. Um, like the outrage comes at the fact that like caste hierarchy is not being upheld. So um, like in Sanyasi's thing, like with Sanyasi, he, he literally in his autobiography says things like, oh, um, you know, the reason why, repatri why he found so uh, repatriation, how he was treated so upon return, like so outrageous is that he, um, like he was like, but I am of the Kshatriya caste. So I, sh I should be entitled to, you know, these illiterate villagers don't know what they're talking about. Like I actually deserve and I'm entitled to their respect. And then with, with San like Dr. Ram Sanadias too, like when he's talking about indenture in Fiji, like the outrage that comes is the fact that someone who like he is upper caste and someone who is like lower caste than him, like has um, authority over him in the field, right? As an overseer or things like that. So it's almost like a lot of the outrage that comes and what gets, really um you know promoted by the nationalist rhetoric is is like the overturning of um of these hierarchies so um so and and again like how gender is kind of is obviously like tied closely into that too um so and even when it comes like and why i sort of brought up like race as well too is that um and, um my supervisor has sort of like written about this as well amitav chaudhry um so he he talks about how um like efforts by like towards sort of the outside in some colonies where like endangered workers were sent that um you would find like um like hindu missionaries even though that's always like not really a thing but but they like they sort of like come and like create like try and like um like foster the sense of like indianness or like culture to avoid having people um having like indian indentured workers like intermarry with african um or like emancipated slaves um or like their and their descendants so it's this like caste like there's this like anxiety about caste, but there's also like an inter like caste relationships uh, and as like a like a form of like sex like being cast as like sexual immorality, but also I would say like interracial relationships too, um, as well. Like that also becomes like I think a source of anxiety between among like communities and among like nationalists within India who are like looking at what's happening overseas and seeing like well this is a problem in the Caribbean. This is why we need to end indenture. Whereas when it comes to like the Bay of Bengal, when people are leaving and you know migrating and doing work. 90% um, of that is happening there, but for some reason, like, that's okay, um, because maybe, like, these, um, these certain categories and structures, like, are not necessarily being overturned in the same ways that they are in places where indentured workers were going. So I hope that that kind of speaks to your question in the way that you wanted. <laughs> Great. I see she's written a thank you in the, in the chat. <laughs> um, so we do have a few more questions uh, in the chat as well. One of them was wondering if you could comment more about the backgrounds of the laborers uh, and where they were recruited from in terms of, yeah, where they were, I guess, which part of India they were from, also their caste background, their education, or any other uh, interesting details. Okay, um, so again, Meg, this isn't necessarily like um, my expertise, but I would say that, um, I would definitely recommend that you read like Ashutosh Kumar's work, um, like for sure, like others who have done like a lot more work on this than I have. But I would say like, if I was just to sum this up, I would say that like people of all, like mostly from Bihar, like a lot of people from Bihar were, were recruited to go. Um, and um, that people came from like a variety of backgrounds as well. Um, yeah, so I, yeah, they're like that. It's, it's like a whole diversity of people, but like those are mainly like the, that was like mainly the place where people were coming from. Um, and like a lot of people, and it depended also too, like, because if we're talking about indenture versus like talking about um, like migration in, in like Southeast Asia, Ceylon, like a lot of the folks who were going to um, like Burma, Malaya, Ceylon were going from like South India to, to these places. So like a lot of people 
from like around like the Madras and stuff like we're going to Ceylon um and and like Malaya and Burma and stuff like that so this like we're not just going to be talking like that's again thing like the thing that I want to um highlight too is like this is yes like this is about like repatriation oftentimes like what's centered in the debate is is indentured repatriation but the reality is that well why like why is the the fact that like 90 percent of those who left to work overseas were not going under indenture but for some reason like you know like they're not being included in this conversation as well um so yeah i hope that helps yeah that's really fascinating um, so there's a, a second question here, which uh, asks about, um, so uh, one of the attendees mentions that he worked in Belize, which is the British Honduras, and he met some people of British, or sorry, of Indian descent there. And his question is uh, wondering if the movement of labor from Canada was considered significant in terms of the movement of laborers, I believe, from Canada to other nations. Yeah, so um, again, like I would really point you to look at Seema Sohi's work on this because she's worked like really extensively on like that. Um, like she's just written and researched like really extensively on like the, the campaign to get um, to, to incentivize like the migration of Punjabis in British Columbia to Honduras to work. But I, that, that didn't actually go through. Like it, it was more like they tried to get it. They tried to set it up, but um, and they tried to sort of frame it again, like post indenture, these these colonization schemes are really interesting because they try and frame them like they're basically a response to the abolition of indenture and the fact that like they can't get any more workers anymore because they can't, you know, like they, they can't actually compete as like employers with other employers because their labor, like the conditions of labor on those plantations are just so awful. Right. And so um, one of the things that then they try and do is like with these with these repatri with these um co sorry colonization schemes is that they're trying to frame these as better um, terms than they actually are. So um, and, and one of the things that they do do to sort of like prove that it's free migration is to um, like engage in these sorts of like community consultation type things. So like they hire um, you know like they hire two representatives. Like it seems seems always book talks about this. Um, so again, if you're interested, you should totally read that. Um, but yeah, but she sort of talks about how um, there's two representatives like from the Punjabi community in British Columbia who go um, and then they like they're asked to report on the condition in Honduras and they say like it's it's stupid like you know it's it's awful like it's not actually that great like people aren't treated that well here and then they go back and obviously like the scheme the scheme the proposed like colonization scheme to attract in, like Indians from Canada to go to Honduras like doesn't actually fall through because um, because the community members reported and they said like it's not not good so don't do it um but um so i would say like it didn't actually happen so i'm not i'm not too sure like how um indians who are currently like people of indian descent who are currently in honduras like if they are um like of indentured descent but i don't think that as far as i know um that there were any folks who came who ended up going like via a canada scheme to honduras great thank you so much um, so, yeah, that's really fascinating. That was a question I had as well as the relation between Canada and uh, migration as well. Um, but we have another question here. So I'll just give this a read. Um, so the question is, could you give us some indication of the relative numbers of indentured laborers who chose to return and those who chose to remain and settle in Africa, the Caribbean, Fiji, and so on at the end of the contracts? Um, also, do you mind describing a bit more about your motivation, or sorry, about the motivation behind the decisions in favor of remaining versus leaving? Mm -hmm. Okay, so just to recap, so I make sure I answer all this. So motivations to leave versus return. Um, and then, sorry, the first part of that question was how many, like the numbers? Exactly, yes. If you have any idea of the sort of numbers of what that looked like. Yeah. Um, I can't recall like, the exact numbers, but um, I would again point you to um, uh, folks who have written about this. So like Lomarsh Rupnarain, um, Basse Omangaru, um, Clem Citron, like they've all sort of like written about this. And um, obviously like Uma Dupilius Mystery's work like has really detailed stats, like they've gone through everything. But I would say like the, the reason why I kind of got interested in this topic too is because of like Caribbean scholars who were like pointing out that it, it actually like was a significant amount of folks who who did decide to either like re-indenture themselves post, post um, finishing like their first indenture contract or to return 
uh, or to, sorry, like that there weren't actually like that many who returned and for, there were several reasons for that. Um, but a lot of people like chose to either like stay outside or to um, stay like outside of India or to like re-indenture themselves and like not the same place, like in another, in another colony to, to work on another like estate. Um, so one of the reasons why like people would stay is that, um, well, sometimes planters, sometimes like planters didn't honor like their, their portion of the um, indenture agreement, which is to provide a free passage to return. So some people just like, some plantation owners just faulted, defaulted on that um, side of their contract, which is why also like, this becomes like a problem in India, like within India too, is like that people aren't upholding that side of the indentured contract because they want them to stay. Um, other times like planters, they, they want to, they, they try and like incentivize people to stay, like was the case in Fiji where they um, leased out, like they gave out parts of estates um, to like when, when sugar, like I think in the 1880s, there was like a crash in the price of sugar or something. And so like they, it wasn't like profitable to keep up this all on their own. Um, so they would like, give portions of the estate to workers, like small portions to settle um, and remain. And I think that this also happened in British Guyana as well and like other places as well. Um, and so some, sometimes people were like incentivized to stay. Um, other times um, people like did actually make a significant amount of, amount of money and, and they went back. Um, so um, what is it? Um, John Kelly and Martha Kaplan, like they, um, in their book, uh, they, they have a chapter in a book by Dipesh, um, um, called Swaraj and Diaspora, Diaspora and Swaraj, which sort of goes, he, so their article kind of um, actually like pushes back against like the report that um, Sanyasi and Chaturvedi wrote because they sort of claim like, you know, there are some repatriates who would like come, come back and like they had actually earned a lot of money um, and they were actually sending back some sort of like remittances and they had like created, you know, like villages and named them after like places in Trinidad and Fiji and whatever. Um, so like that, that was the thing, like they, you know, they, they, they did come back with some money, um, but that wasn't like, obviously like everybody's experience. So, um, and that's also like where, like, I have a problem with that article too, because um, I feel like they don't really go through um, the fact that like, when I talk about how Sanyasi had so much trouble trying to publish um, the fact that a lot of repatriates were struggling um, in, in at least like the 19. 20s, like around that time, around the abolition of indenture too, um, when these like incentivized repatriation schemes um, come about. So um, I think I answered a good deal of that question in a sort of like walkabout way, but yeah. Yeah, thank you so much. It's quite complex. So um, thank you. So I think we've gone through all of the questions in the chat. Um, so if anyone has any other questions, feel free to raise your hand or again, type it into the chat as well. Um, one question that perhaps I can ask you while we're waiting um, that I had was, uh, if you have any thoughts on how these, uh, I guess the ancestors or the um, descendants of these uh, laborers are doing today and how are the relations between um, their families and the majority communities where where they ended up. Um, I know you mentioned interracial relationships being um, kind of, I guess, protected against uh, during this time period, but are these relations improving? And uh, if you had any thoughts on that? Yeah, that's a big question. Um, so <laughs> well, thank you for asking it. Um, yeah, so I would say, again, like my supervisor's research sort of like goes into this too, is that like, if you look at the different places, so like when I, I'll just put up this map again. Um, Okay, so like these are all the different places in which like indentured repatriates, sorry, like like indentured folks went, but obviously like as I talked about, um, places are on like the Bay Bengals, like Ceylon, like Malaya, um, like Sri Lanka, like all the, like, yeah, um, Burma, like all these places, like they all had pop, like huge populations of like Indian migrants, workers. Um, and so I would say like, it's really dependent on, on the context because like in each of these different places, like the context, um, was very different and that like different numbers of Indians went to those places um, like depending on like their proximity or like Indian nationalist interest in like making something happen in those places like there would be um, like different degrees of like hybridity or like religious syn like syncretism or um, you know like integration or whatever so like for example in Jamaica like the, a lot of people did it was like a smaller proportion of Indians who went and a lot of people did actually like end up intermarrying and so um, like you have a lot of 
um, like intercultural families in Jamaica as compared to like Mauritius or, um, or like South Africa, like in Natal, right? Um, so um, I think like part of this depended on like proximity to the Indian subcontinent, which is again, like why I go back to Harshita is a like really important question about um, like caste, like, you know, like one of the reasons why and, and race and, and how those kind of like tie together is that this anxiety of, oh, well, people are like, are like quote unquote losing their culture and the kind of like coded ways in which race works their way into that. Um, and, and also like caste, but in, so in like a lot of Caribbean colonies, like you, you have a lot of like, um, you know, culturally mixed families. Um, and um, again, like in more recent years that like towards the end of the 20th century, like when you see, even like today, like if you, if you see sort of like the ways in which like diaspora is mobilized by homelands, right? Like how, like what are the different ways in which um, like the reason why I guess I got so interested in this project is that um, I found it really interesting that like immediately post um, like 1947, um, you see figures like nationalists like Nehru and, and Sarojini Naidu and others who they tell the diaspora like, you know, we're, you actually like, we're going to kind of cut you off in that like you don't actually have any protections like you're not really entitled to any like help from um, like independent India anymore. Whereas like in the 1920s and 30s, you see um, people like act like Indian nationalists, like actively trying to engage the diaspora and saying like, you are the global Indian diaspora, you need to fight to like, you know, um, support the anti-colonial nationalist movement from wherever you are. And, um, you know, like you will basically like a lot of my dissertation right, talks about how um, a lot of sort of like Indian nationalist rhetoric um, like calls on the diaspora and tells them like, you are only going to be able to fight anti-Indian legislation in the places where you're settled if India becomes independent. But then immediately post 1947, like that's not the case. They say like, look, we can't help you out. And this becomes a problem in places like Ceylon where like well in Sri independent Sri Lanka where um, a lot of like the TA state workers who are um, like Tamil Indian, they end up kind of like becoming stateless. And then that ends up becoming sort of like the roots of the, like, like those folks and like where, like they're sort of, um, you know, uncertain place, like around the Bay of Bengal, like this also becomes an issue in like Burma, we see, um, like, again, like, um, anti Indian, like, yeah, like, like, sort of discrimination against Indians, like in Malaya, etc. So um, I would say like, that, like, that is a whole huge, like, complex story that goes into, goes into it. And like, all these different contexts are so very different. My long witted reply. <laughs> your question. <laughs> yeah, thank you so much. It's all super fascinating. Um, yeah, I completely empathize that it's very complex and very context dependent. Um, all right, so again, feel free to raise your hand if you have any more questions for Hina, or again, feel free to jot them into the chat bar. Um, I have a question. It's, Hina. Yeah, go ahead. Sorry, Sharad, I just wanted to jump in a little bit and add a little thing to what he now is saying and maybe get her comment on that too, but you should go ahead. Uh, um, Hashita, maybe you should finish your comment and then I can ask my question. Okay, thank you. Uh, I just wanted to say that it's been interesting also in the last, I think around 10, 15 years maybe following the Indian nation states uh, relationship with um, the diaspora, especially the, the descendants of indentured laborers who left during colonial times. Yeah. So one of the initiatives by the Indian nation state to connect with diasporic communities and solicit or elicit uh, investments back into India from them because the perception is that diasporic communities are necessarily doing more economically, are more economically powerful than the ones, than the folks within India. So there is a kind of return to the motherland sort of an approach to diasporic communities, right? Mm -hmm. And so that's called the Pravasi Bharatiya. Yeah. yeah, that's the festival, but then there's also like a commission for it. And yeah. in the last few years, they've really kind of harped on the fact that uh, political leaders in countries like Fiji and Mauritius and I believe in Guyana as well are of Indian origin or have Indian heritage and so there's been a sort of claiming of oh how well Indians have done abroad 
yeah. which basically erases all of this history that we've, we've just heard from you, Hina. Yeah. So, yeah, I find that to be, I mean, it's interesting to think about the relationships, not just to the families and communities, but the relationship that's now been reframed and set up by nation states with communities abroad. So Yeah, I think, and again, like, thank you so much for bringing that up, because it also kind of reminds me of like how I think this, this story of like, like homeland, like mobilizing diaspora oftentimes is like at the very root of the model minority myth, like this idea that, um, like I think especially like the case in, um, in South Africa um, and like different like, like East Africa, like all these different places where, um, and even like Canada too, like that we see that here too. It's like this, this idea that, that gets mobilized of like, um, like you said, Harshita, like just to sort of elaborate on what you said, like that, um, like oh, so sort of like celebrating like Indian quote unquote success when not realizing that this there is this interesting kind of place that we have here too like um, as in especially like in the South African context and like East African context where like Indians um, Indian diaspora like they're they're attempting to like get sort of like parity with white settlers oftentimes but then um, they're not necessarily like they want like inclusion within white supremacy but then. Um, they're not necessarily like challenging white supremacy. They just like want inclusion into it. So like they're still okay with like upholding these systems of um, of like settler colonialism in, in South Africa and East Africa, like even in Canada here too. Like I, I think that's also something that I, I would like implore <laughs> South Asian diaspora in Canada to sort of like think about in the same way um, here too. Like what are the contexts in which they sort of like end up plunked in and then what, um, like how are they interacting in those contexts? Um, and what are the ways in which sometimes like they end up um, I guess, uh, what's the word? Like appealing to um, white supremacy in order to like get advantages as well um, without necessarily like, obviously like that's not the case all the time. Like there are so many instances in which like people express solidarity with, um, like if I think of like um, Sana Ayer has written about Mukund Singh who was like a trade union activist in, in Nairobi who um, was also you know, interested in, in ensuring that like African workers also, um, uh, you know, like receive like better conditions. Um, and in like South Africa too, like folks like Ahmed Kathrada who like goes to jail with Mandela. So like there are those examples as well, but I think like what I wish would get a little bit more talked about too was the fact that like there were also many who were upholding these systems of, um, of like racism and settler colonialism too and not necessarily like challenging them to dismantle them, but challenge them for the purpose of like getting inclusion within them. Thank you, Hina. Um, very fascinating. Um, so I think Shada, you can feel free to jump in at this point. Um, okay, uh, thanks uh, Hina and thanks Ashna. You know, just as you were uh, talk here, talking, uh, you know, doing your presentation and in, and in your responses, the thing that's been working uh, in my mind is, you know, I'm not a historian, but I'm fascinated by history, uh, you know, for what it is, but also for its relevance to what is currently happening, right? There are some processes uh, that are so central to both capitalism and to uh, nation states. And one of them is um, uh, labor uh, movement and uh, particular forms uh, in which uh, labor is then captivated, right? So in, uh, in, in the context in which you are talking about, it's mostly so-called unskilled uh, labor, you know, indentured labor. But currently, of course, what we are seeing um, to a lesser extent now, but certainly uh, for a long time in India, and, and I think it might come back again, is, um, is the movement of uh, skilled uh, workers, right? So if you see countries like Canada, uh, US and other countries, they're also interested in uh, migrant, uh, you know, skilled migrant laborers. Right? So they're not interested in um, people with uh, low, uh, what are called low skills. They really want this high, uh, high skills, right? So in some ways, there is, a, uh, there is a sort of a repeat of what we have seen historically uh, in the context that you described, uh, happening in a slightly different way in the global, um, you know, system, economic systems. 
I mean, this is not so much a question, but if you have something to share, uh, I know this is not uh, the focus of your work, but I thought, you know, why not just collectively think aloud about some of these issues? Thanks. I would actually challenge the idea that um, Canada is not looking for unskilled workers. Like, we, it was, it's temporary foreign workers who pick all of our agriculture, like all of our, you know, our farm products. Um, and then they don't get the they don't get the benefits of citizenship or pathway to citizenship. So I'm uh, sorry, Hina. I meant more the Indian uh, labor, not uh, yeah. I was thinking of the agriculture, season agriculture uh, laborers coming to India, and it's all the, uh, the uh, coming from the Caribbean, and it's all the same in Canada. But I was more referring to the Indian uh, labor. Sorry, just a clarification. Yeah. So um, I guess could you repeat like. I, you're, I guess just like to reflect on that, like the fact that, you know, who is actually like coming, um, like how does Canada sort of like, w what relationship does like, my, like what sort of migration now like comes to Canada and like how does that sort of connect to what? Um, yeah, not just Canada, right? But yeah. US, uh, the European Union, all of these countries. Mm -hmm. um, so in an earlier time, like in the context that you were talking about, the historical period that you were talking about, they were largely British and Dutch colonies. So again, yeah. European powers, um, they had particular forms of um, uh, labor, particular formation of labor, right? Vis-a-vis uh, -vis capitalism and colonialism. Um, and and I, I, I'm seeing some similarities to the present context in the current global economic order that it may not be so much unskilled labor as it was then. It may not be indentured labor in the exact form but still there are ways in which uh, labor is appropriated. Um, and, and I think predominantly in the way high skill labor is, um, is, uh, is being appropriated by some of these uh, countries, right? So, so in, in, in many ways, there are similarities is what I'm trying to, uh, to say. Mm -hmm. But I would also, I guess, like push back on that too in that, um, I think like maybe if we're thinking about like international students and like what they sort of contribute to, like especially like Indian international students and the ways in which like sort of their research labor is like appropriated by Canadian universities and then like not really, again, like not really giving like clear pathways to citizenship, not giving the same kind of supports. Like I think we saw this really strongly when the pandemic came about in March, how um, a lot of like international students, like including Indian international students were like, you know, like especially graduate students were like, you're giving a lot of labor to the university in exchange for like not very much pay um, with like very little entitlement to support from the government, um, you know, for the work that you're doing and what you're contributing to sort of like Canada's research industry. I would say like that, I think like that's maybe like an important component and maybe like where I would see sort of crossovers to how, uh, like to, to, the, to what I'm seeing like in, in the context that I'm talking about in like the early um, 20th century as well. Um, but, yeah, I mean, again, like if we're going to talk about um, like Indian migration to the global north too, like I think that we also need to think about what um, that it, I guess there, there's like a whole diversity of folks who like are in these places, right? Like, so if we think about, for example, like the UK, um, like we have Indian diaspora in the UK who have like been there a long time like as a result of these processes that I'm sort of talking about like through sort of like multi like colonial um like going through like East Africa like the Caribbean etc and then like ending up in the UK but then how I think a lot of uh, and then how that's again like very different from like new like folks who come like direct from India um as well um but I also think again like you see a lot of the the same problems that I kind of identify in the 1920s of um like Indian diaspora who are sort of like pushing for their inclusion within white supremacy, um, but not actually necessarily like challenging it um, in like the Home Secretary of the UK um, or of, um, I guess like right wing, like Indian politicians in the United States. Um, you know, like I think that that, who also come as like professional, like many, like at least in the United States, like many of whom come as like professional diasporas too. So I th think that um, it's like kind of hard to always like to give a, definitive um, like reflection or thought to what to what you're saying um, but I think I hope yeah I would that's all that's what I would say about that <laughs>
Great, thank you very much, Hina. So again, feel free to raise your hand if you have a question for Hina. Yeah, I guess, um, oh, sorry. Oh, never mind. Yeah. Any, any other thoughts there or? Um, I just thought like Arshita's comment about like celebrating, um, you know, like that there were messages in India celebrating Jagmeet Singh. I was like deputy prime minister, but then at the same time, there was also like a lot of like Hindu nationalist backlash towards him, um, you know, getting in and like how a lot of the, the rhetoric around like Jagmeet Singh's leadership role is that, well, you know, like, um, it, like, I guess sort of the same, um, like anti sikh rhetoric that you kind of see, like within India pushing back against like, like his own, like Khalistan activism and like, um, like activism for Sikh rights. So I would say like, just in, I just noticed like Shrat this comment, uh, sorry, um, actually this comment about that, like that we like, yes, there's like positive stuff like that, but then I don't know. I mean, primarily I've only, I've only really seen like the negative backlash within, um, South Asian diaspora here um towards like Jagmeet Singh's like leadership so. sorry my just to contextualize why I wrote that comment was because I was thinking in terms of how the nation state disavows uh like the violence towards minorities within the country and also the violences and the erasures suffered by the communities that left or were made to leave as in the case of indentured labor but at the same time now the kind of rhetoric that dovetails with India as a superpower is to claim that mm -hmm. people of Indian origin who have done quote unquote well for themselves and have uh, come to political leadership positions are somehow the glory of that is reflected back onto the nation state. So I remember when this started happening I had family that were sending me messages saying, wow, look at you, you're in Canada and you have a Indian prime minister. And I said, well, no, I don't think Jagmeet Singh would in any case identify himself as Indian. And also he, he is from a community and his own sort of, I think, political history reflects a very, a, 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 an opposition to the Indian nation state and, you know, yeah. So it's very much like a, a, you know, the kind of blanket claiming of, oh, our sons have gone abroad and done well for themselves. Yeah. And that, and something like that circulating in nationalistic, patriotic kind of uh, veins, like basically does what you're talking about, right? It erases all of this kind of complicated history with the nation state. Uh, my work is sort of centered in India as well. That's why I'm kind of thinking in that context of how, you know, in a lot of ways, the legal kind of, the, like what you were talking about, the legal expulsions and the kind of legal uh, context for repatriation and all. I, I see the, some of those echoes in nationalist rhetoric and claiming and, you know, how the economic context has obviously shifted. Um, but there is a kind of very instrumental claiming and disavowal of people abroad is what I'm, I'm trying to kind of get at. So. Mm -hmm. Great, thank you very much. Um, so I guess this could be your final call for questions since we are just about at the end of our webinar. Hi there, Hina. This is Minakshi. Um, I hope uh, it's okay just to squeeze in one last question. Um, my question to you is, um, as a descendant of uh, uh, parties that have that immigrated out of India and were, were, were part of this movement around the globe, what was your motivation for your um, research into this area? What, and what do you feel has been the long-term benefits of uh, this globalization of um, Asians around the uh, around the world what do you feel has been the, the biggest benefit 
of it. Um, so I guess like what, I'll just answer first like the, the first part about, um, you know, like why um, I, I think this is an important, or like why I find it interesting or like why, um, yeah, like again, like this is sort of like my own background. I'm, my grandparents like left India in the 1950s. They worked in Kenya um, and like one in Uganda for like several years and then went to the UK like right before the um, like the 1968 like British Citizenship Act like stopped um, non-white citizens from the empire from being able to like be entitled to come to to the UK. So um, I think part of it is just that um, a lot of like diaspora studies that like a lot of times I think like Indian diaspora is really what India diaspora offers to like diaspora studies is so interesting just because of like the multi-layered like how multi-layered and how like diverse and also like very well documented like their diaspora history is. So um, I think that it like especially in a place like Canada where like we have all these layers of diaspora here or like in the UK where there are the, all of those different layers of um, diaspora it sort of shows like it, it is this really interesting um, push back to sort of like nationalist rhetoric that um, I guess like Harshita was like um, trying to like that, that Harshita was talking about as well where like this these efforts to like claim um, you know diaspora populations as like Indian um, in certain years and then just like totally ignore them in other years but I think it, it sort of like pokes holes in um, the idea of like nationalist rhetoric and um, that you know like that it is a very um, like fragile like unstable um, way of thinking about belonging um, so I would say like the the case of global Indian diaspora history is is really interesting in that and I don't think it's like also necessarily unique to Indian diaspora history too like I think that there's many um, examples within um, like transatlantic like black diaspora histories too where these ideas of um, like like belonging and um, like I guess with the examples of like Sierra Leone and Liberia how sometimes like it's um, like the idea of like belonging in a certain place can be mobilized to move people to other places so like when I was talking about the colonization schemes earlier um, you know like one of the ideas was that British Guyana could be like marketed to Indians in South Africa who are facing like anti-Indian legislation that they could come to British Guyana and that British Guyana could be an Indian colony there was another case for that in Tanganyika where um, you know, like, oh, Tanganyika can be an Indian colony, like a homeland for Indians who couldn't settle in India. Um, and similarly, like Liberia and Sierra Leone are sort of like, they're similar to that. Like Israel is kind of like similar to that too. Like the idea that you can have, the idea that, that you know, homeland is inherent, the idea that there can be a place where like, you know, ethnic homogeneity is key and that that is what defines belonging. Like, I think that um, all, all the ways in which that hasn't been the case, that, that, um, that those ideas have been challenged. I think that is what the story of Indian diaspora, but again, not exclusively Indian diaspora, has, has shown us, right? That it's, they're really useful tools. It's looking back at Indian diaspora history is a really useful tool for, for poking holes in um, like nationalist rhetoric and ideas about patriotism. Amazing. Thank Hina. you. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you for the question. I think that was the perfect way to sort of wrap up our very complex discussion today. Um, thank you so much, Hina, for your fascinating discussion and your research. And uh, we really enjoyed having you. Uh, we'd also like to say thank you to the audience. Thank you so much for joining us today. Hope you continue to take care and stay well. Um, also, thank you to Shraddha for organizing this event, uh, to Shirley and to Heather for supporting us in making this all run smoothly. Um, a quick note that the next Circle webinar will be on October 28th, and we will have Dr. Sanjay Ruparilia joining us. Uh, his title, sorry, his talk will be titled A New India, A New China, The Politics of Narendra Modi and Xi Jinping. Uh, also, if you'd like to join the Circle uh, email list, please send an email to indiaresearch-l at uaguelph.ca, um, and that's included in the chat as well. All right, so that's, that's it for today. Thank you so much to everyone again, and I uh, hope you stay well.